Nicole Riem, welcome to Strategy Simplified. Really excited to have you on the podcast today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, excited to, to have you to hear your story, share your story with uh, the Strategy Simplified community today. So let's not waste any time. Uh, we'd love to get right into your story. And just a little disclaimer here. Uh, we're recording in the summer, but by the time this comes out, you will have started at Bain & Company as an associate consultant. So congrats on Thank the you. job there. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, so can we kind of rewind a little bit, go back to the beginning of your story? Can you just kind of uh, walk us through it? Like, where did you kind of first uncover your, uh, you know, that consulting was something you wanted to pursue? Yeah, so I just graduated from the University of Virginia, and there I was an economics and sociology double major, um, which is a definitely a little bit of a weird combination, but I was always really interested in both like business and learning more about consumers and consumer, consumer behavior, but also really interested in learning more about like people and society. Um, so it was really the perfect mix for me, um, and I really enjoyed my time there. Um, but getting into when I first knew I was interested in management consulting, I definitely wasn't one of those people um, that like came to college knowing a lot about consulting or knew that I was even interested in pursuing something that was more business related. I kind of came into college undecided with my majors, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, so I didn't really know anything about consulting. I was never part of any consulting clubs um, and never really knew that I wanted to enter that field. I think the first time I really started to think about management consulting and kind of consider it as a career path was the summer after my second year, so my sophomore year of college. Um, I started to like really think about what I was interested in. That summer is a really good time to start thinking about what internships you want to apply to for your the summer after your third year and then also kind of thinking about like what internships do you want to do that will maybe lead you to something in the future so mm -hmm. at that time i was working at a company called compass marketing which is a strategic marketing and innovation agency that focuses specifically on accelerating growth for health and wellness brands um so through my work with compass i got to see what it was like to kind of solve these consulting like problems but in a much more specific niche for these um marketing companies and also for companies that were very health and wellness based um and it was a very small company my supervisors were great it was three women who had founded the company together um, and one of them had actually worked at bcg one summer so she had a little okay. bit of a background in consulting um, and talking to her about what her experience was like with consulting and through my work with Compass, I got to see what it was like to solve these consulting-like problems, but in a more specific niche. Um, and I decided that I wanted to do work that was really similar to what I did, but at a bigger company, so on a bigger scale, um, where I could kind of learn not only from my mentors, but also from my peers. Um, and I also wanted to be exposed to different industries, not just looking at health and wellness, but looking at other things. So I think that was where the interest kind of started. That makes sense. You had kind of, you wanted that kind of broad scope of, of impact across kind of industries, problem types. You like the, the, the diversity that that could bring. That makes yeah. sense. Okay, so you decided, let's let's go for it. Let's give this thing a shot. Um, so you were successful in landing a summer internship with Bain for uh, you know the summer after your junior year. Can you walk us through that process of how you landed that internship? You know, um, just kind of walk us through the, the the different pieces of that, and then we may double click uh, to go a little bit deeper on on different parts of the process. Yeah, absolutely. So once I decided that consulting was something that I wanted to learn more about and look into, um, I started doing like a lot of research and networking work. I was still kind of split on if I wanted to do management consulting or something that was more like growth marketing, which is more similar to what I was doing. Um, but I decided to go ahead with applying for those consulting roles just because the timeline was a little bit earlier. So um, it made sense to still do the consulting recruiting and then see how that went and decide what I wanted to do from there. Um, but after I decided and did that initial research, I started to do some networking that summer. 
and I probably started that in like mid-July. This is when the deadlines were a little bit different and this was like the first time that they were offering a July deadline, but I knew that I wasn't going to be ready for that because I didn't start doing my process until the summer. Um, so I was applying for the September deadline. So just to give a little context on okay. what the timeline looked like for me. Um, and I started doing a lot of networking. I started by doing networking with UVA students who were currently interns in the Bain Boston office, which is where I'm working and where I interned. Um, and talking to them was really great and really helpful. It was pretty low stress. And I think like getting to talk to someone who had just entered the company was being an intern um, was really helpful. Learned a lot about their process. And then through that, I just really started to build a network of people that um, were able to really support me through my application process. I, um, after every networking call, I would ask and follow up and say like, it was really great chatting with you about X, Y, Z, whatever it was we talked about. Um, would love to learn more about this. Do you have anyone else that you know that would maybe be able to lend a different perspective or um, give some background as to what it was like to work in, at a, on a case in this sector or whatever it was. Okay. Um, and I think after doing that networking process and specifically with Bain, because I mainly networked with Bain people, um, I was really, really excited about potentially working at a consulting firm. I think something about consulting is that a lot of people apply to it and they think that they want to do recruiting, but they don't actually know that much about what it is. Um, so I think getting to hear people talk about how passionate they were about their jobs and also about how much they loved the company and the people they worked with um, was really exciting for me. Um, so after doing that networking process and asking people what they thought like the best next steps would be, I decided I decided to start doing some case prep, I would say in like late August. Um, I'm definitely one of those people that likes to be overprepared for things rather than underprepared. So I know some of my peers were people who didn't want to like start doing case prep until they knew that they had an interview. But I'm like the opposite of that. I was like, even if I never get an interview, I would rather like be really, really prepared and be, You're gonna be like, prepared, no. yeah. Yeah, and know how to do these things. Um, so I started doing case prep. I um, started doing it mainly with people that I was really comfortable with because obviously when you start out, um, some people definitely get the knack of it pretty quickly. I was definitely a little bit slower to the game and needed a few a few go arounds to feel more comfortable. Um, and so I case probably, I would say like once a week or something around that. And if I wasn't casing and I had free time, um, I would either try to like read through cases and like time myself looking at um, case prompts and then doing a case structure, timing it, and then record myself um, saying like how I'd explain the framework and then going through doing cases like that when I didn't have someone to run an actual case with me. Okay. Um, and then when I got back to UVA, I found a case partner and we kind of continued to case. We cased probably weekly. Um, and that was super helpful to have someone where you knew you would consistently be casing with them. And we, the structure that we did was like, I would give her a case and she would give me fat and I would give her feedback and then vice versa. So I think being on both sides of it definitely helped me um, with my casing process. And then yeah. throughout this month of September, I continued to network, continue to um, talk to people. And then I can't remember the exact date of the deadline, but I submitted my application in September. And then I think I found out pretty soon after that I got a first round interview. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Thanks for the, the in-depth overview of your process there. So you kind of lowered the stress of the networking process by networking with folks who you had some form of like connection with you know, yeah. alumni of your program. Um, that's really smart. Um, you know, obviously not everybody has, is at a target school or, or, you know, there's not a lot of folks at their school that have gone to consulting, but for sure, if, if that's something that, you know, you have uh, through your school or alumni, that's a great uh, place to start with networking kind of uh, a low stress uh, place to start. Um, so you started your case prep, you said maybe around the end of August. Um, how, how long was it between that and when you had your first case interview? I would say like a little bit over a month. So okay. I, I think in the beginning, when I first started casing, I probably was running cases a lot more frequently since I also started um, before I went back to school. It was a lot easier to schedule out that time to do cases. Um, and I was really lucky lucky because I had a lot of kind of older mentors and people who were willing to run cases with me. 
And then as I got closer to the time when I was submitting my application, um, I started to reach out to people who worked at Bain, who I had networked with before, who had offered to run a case with me, um, to run a case with them because that was definitely more of a high stakes environment. They were able to give you a case from like the Bain case book, which is more mm-hmm. official because it's based on the cases that they give in interviews. And then it was also helpful just because um, it's obviously really helpful to have a case partner and people that you know helping you run cases. But when it's an unfamiliar person who you kind of want to impress more, um, and you don't feel as comfortable with, it definitely emulates more of an interview like environment yeah. than if yeah. you're just casing with someone who you're really comfortable with. Um, so I think doing yeah. that definitely helped me a lot as well. When you reached back out to the folks at Bain that you'd previously you know, chatted with in networking conversations, did what was their response? Like, did you find that they were, you know, really open, happy to help, or was it maybe a little bit uh, more difficult, you know, finding those people who'd be willing to do, like, you know, invest in a the time it takes to run through a full case? Um, I will say one of the things that really drew me to Bain is how willing everyone was to help you and to help you through the process. I talked to people who I had never met before and didn't overlap with at UVA at all, um, and they would make the time to talk to me for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, It is definitely a little bit intimidating to reach out to someone to ask them to run a case because you're asking them to dedicate a lot of their time to you. Um, But I think how I kind of handled that was by only really reaching out to people who I felt comfortable enough with or who had offered in the phone call. Um, And I think that was a good way to go about it because when I would say kind of like, what would you recommend for next tips, next steps, like how going forward, like, is there anything that you think I should be doing? Um, And if they would say like, I would definitely recommend running cases. I'm happy to run a case with you if that's something you Mm -hmm. would need in the future. I would be like, absolutely. I would love to take you up on that. Um, And we'll send over a time that maybe we could do that. Um, So I think kind of treating it like that, I would never like cold reach out to someone and say, would you run a case for me? I think that at Bain, a lot of the people would be happy to. If someone reached out to me, I'd be happy to run a case for them. Um, but I think you do want to be respectful of people's time. And then also just making sure that um, I was prepared. So if I asked someone to run a case, I would say like, happy to send over a case that I know I haven't done in this case book. Um, if that's easier for you, or if you have a case that you like to run, let me know whichever works. Um, so just being super flexible and respecting their time while also being accommodating to whatever they may need you to do. Mm-hmm. I think it's helpful because I think a lot of people have a conception that consultants are you know super super busy never have time or or like for some reason like don't want to you know talk with you or you know answer your questions or or case with you and like yeah some consultants that's that's true but um you know for for a lot of consultants like recruiting is is part of their their job description and they also want to give back because they had people do that for them back when they were going through the recruiting process so uh I think, Nicole, that's just helpful to kind of, um, yeah, l- lower the kind of stakes. And I think it's a helpful mindset to have to just that people, you know, want to help you or a lot of, a lot yeah. of people do want to, to, to help you out. Yeah, absolutely. And you also want to be strategic about who you're reaching out to. I'm not asking like a senior manager to run a case with me. I'm asking people who are AC1s, AC2s have gone through this process relatively recently. Um, So I think also just being mindful of that is a good way to go about it. Earlier, you had said something about uh, you had some older mentors and kind of people who are willing to, you know, help you through the process. Can you, I, I know there's a lot of interest in like really tactical um like like what does that look like from from our audience so is there any like one piece of advice one tip you have for people maybe you know who who don't have that and are are really you know looking to that and think that they would benefit from having uh folks with with more experience who you know would be willing to invest in their in their success Yeah, that's a good question. I think I was really lucky because UVA has a huge presence at Bain and in the Bain Boston office specifically, which is the office that I was interested in applying to. I would say that there are so many resources out there that you can get access to that don't necessarily have to be one mentor who's helping you through the process. I think things like Management Consultant obviously is great. 
Um, I think you can also reach out to people. I've had people reach out to me on LinkedIn. And like, again, while you want to be tactical about who you're reaching out to and what you're saying in the message, I think for the most part, people will be happy to speak to you if you kind of ask them to carve out that time. Um, I think with Bain, if you're recruiting from a non-target school, the recruiters are a really big asset in that and will connect you to people who can kind of guide you through that process. Um, And I think by treating people, the people that you're like networking with, the people that you're running cases with, like people too. I think a lot of times people forget that um, a lot of times the people that you're talking to are only like a few years older than you. You wanna be as professional as possible, but you don't wanna be a robot just throwing questions in their face and like not having a normal conversation. So if you're able to do that with someone that a recruiter is able to connect you with or someone that you find out of through a friend of a friend, I think that's a great way to find kind of an informal mentor. Um, but again, I think that there's so many great free resources out there that you can find. I watched a ton of like, I would just Google like management consulted or management consulting case interview sample or like best tips for management consulting. Like there's so many YouTube videos, so many articles because so many people do recruiting. I think one of the benefits is that there's so much information out there. Um, so I would say like, it's definitely great to connect with people. And I don't think that there's necessarily a replacement for that, but I would say that there are other things that can supplement your journey just as much as that. 100%. Yeah. I think one of the overarching themes that's coming out of this is that yeah, don't, don't like, don't do this process in isolation. Like people will, will help you. And it, it's very difficult to <laughs> kind of try to do, do this whole thing on your own, if not impossible. Yeah. Uh, Nicole, you you had just mentioned resources, so uh, let's just quickly go there. Um, can you recommend kind of one or two resources that were you know critical in in your process? I would say the best resource that I used was case books, and these case books you can find online for free. I found that UVA Darden's case book was really helpful at laying out cases and making them super easy to understand, even if you were just doing it by yourself. Um, I know that my schools, like the Econ Career Office, they have access to a bunch of case books. So I'm sure for a lot of people's individual schools, if they email their career services team, they would be able to get them access to um, different resources and case books like that. But oftentimes, if you Google like blank business school case book, you'll be able to find something online for free that'll have a lot of um, sample cases in there as long as explanations written out. Um, I think that was one of my greatest um, resources. I'd say another resource that I used a lot, um, I definitely listened to a lot of podcast episodes while I was doing recruiting, um, just because when I would go on walks on stuff or walking to class, I would listen to things like Strategy Simplified, which is Management Consultants, Management Consultants podcast um listen to episodes like how i got the job um i would listen to a lot of like case interviews between two professionals who had been doing it for a while um could, just because that helped me get ideas on like oh this is a great bucket to add into my framework if i'm looking at a market sizing case or like a profitability case or whatever it may be um so i think that those are two free resources that you can find and there's there's a lot of them out there um so i okay. think things like that really helped me and they're great because you don't really need to be dedicating your full, full attention. Like I would read a case book as, as I would be like eating lunch or something. And that would be a really helpful way for me to just like get some time in because obviously while recruiting while doing classes can be really tough. Um, but just doing little things like that, listening to podcasts as you walk to class, it kind of like stays at the top of your mind. Um, and you get to like learn new things as you're doing it. That was really helpful. I think what the last couple of years have brought about for for aspiring consultants is just you know there, there's always been a lot of information but now it's even more easily accessible there's more podcasts there's more case books there's more etc and so there's so many resources sources out there um that you can use it sometimes there's too many so you just gotta yeah pick one <laughs> yeah it can <laughs> definitely be somewhere. over it can be overwhelming for sure but i think if you have an idea of what you're looking for specifically like i wouldn't just search consulting podcast I would google like what am I specifically wanting to get out of this podcast like do I want to know how I got this job Bain internship I would like google that and then something will come up that's super specific I think that's a lot more helpful than just like consulting podcasts like things like that yeah absolutely well Nicole we've talked about how you kind of were successful in this process but 
I'm sure not everything was, you know, unicorns and, and rainbows. So um, can you talk about, you know, like what's one or two kind of challenges you ran into and, and you know, how you how you overcame those? Yeah, um, I think one of the biggest challenges that I ran into as I was doing recruiting was just this feeling of imposter syndrome. I, um, because as I mentioned before, I was never part of any consulting clubs. I didn't even really know that I wanted to do consulting until the summer of my second year, which is pretty late. At, honestly, like at that point, I feel like a lot of people have already decided, a lot of people have investment banking jobs that they've gotten like the end of, in the spring of second year. Um, so I definitely struggled with kind of overcoming the feeling that I wasn't good enough for the roles that I was applying to. And I think that in general, recruitment is extremely competitive and it's really hard to not compare yourself to other extremely like well-qualified applicants. I think seeing other people posting things about like XYZ jobs they were getting um, can be really hard to kind of like block out all that noise. But I think that what really helped me kind of get through that was just focusing on myself and not letting um, the chatter get to my head. I think sure. I was definitely someone who wasn't I wasn't private about my recruiting process, but I definitely know people who were very public about their process, and that does that wasn't something that I felt like worked really for me. Um, so I think just really focusing on myself and kind of just not letting that external ch- chatter get in my head um, helped as I was applying, and also just like focusing on if I am to get this role, how awesome would that be? Um, so kind of focusing on that rather than like, oh, it'll suck if I don't get this role. More just like, how cool would it be if I did get it? Um, And then I think another thing that's tough is definitely carving out time for networking and casing in addition to all of the classes and clubs that you're kind of already juggling. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think going back to school, that was definitely a little bit of a challenge for me. But I think once I got into more of a schedule with my networking casing and started to treat recruitment like its own one month class, that was like a major crash course. It became a lot easier to um, manage the workload. Yeah, Nicole, super powerful tips here. Um, block out the chatter, and um, yeah, comparison is the, t- the thief of joy. And so, uh, I love what you shared there. Thank you for for sharing that with us. Uh, I know a lot of folks are going to find it really, really beneficial. Um, you know, I mean, I identify with the imposter syndrome, and I know there's a lot of folks who who will as well. So, thank you, yeah, for, for sharing that. Well. As we're kind of getting close to the end of our time here, um, can you just, do you have like one word of encouragement on folks going through the the process right now? Like what's, you know, looking back, what's, what would you have needed to hear back in, you know, a couple years ago? That's a good question. Um, I think that um, just knowing that you can only do, this is so cliche, but like you can only do your best. So I think that it's really easy when you're doing recruitment, as I kind of just talked about, to compare yourself to what other people are doing. I know people who were like, oh, I ran 100 plus cases. Like you just have to, like you can only do what you're able to do. Like maybe for you running 100 cases is great. For a lot of people, that's not great. No one really has time for that. If you do, like good for you. If you don't, don't worry about that at all. Like People were saying like, oh, I met every single person in that office and I talked to XYZ senior partner and like you're you're thinking, oh my gosh, I only networked with like five people. Like you can't let that deter you from what you're trying to do. And like ultimately you're trying to get the role for yourself. Like you can't worry about what other people are doing. Um, so I think just like remembering that like you can only do like the best that you're doing and like that you've put in so much hard work to get to where you are to be in a position to be applying to these roles. So um just like keeping that in mind I think that like recruitment is so tough like it really is a tough process even when you get the job like it's still tough I still feel imposter syndrome working there the whole summer the whole time I thought like oh my gosh someone's gonna take this away from me and I'm not gonna get to come back here like I think it's really hard to not think that way but I think that um just like trusting yourself and knowing that all of the hard work you've done has paid off and like it's such a competitive process but it's also like can be really worth it in the end all right Hard work pays off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Well, Nicole, there's I know there's a lot of gold inside your kind of summer internship process, uh, but I know we're going to do another episode about that. So I'm going to save that for for that episode. So folks, you'll just have to uh, look out for uh, 
Nicole's kind of experience as an as a Bane intern. Uh, that's going to be a super fun episode. Um, but Nicole, final question before we get to a couple of uh, strategy simplified traditional questions. Um, but what are you most looking forward to about starting full time at Bain and Company? I'm definitely looking forward to just reconnecting with all the other interns that I got to meet and become friends with and just like the overall Bain community. Um, it's very cheesy, but I'm sure if anyone who's listening to this podcast has ever talked to a Bainy about why they love Bain, they always say it's because of the people. And I think that after working there, I can say it's definitely really true. Like the community is a huge part of what makes working at Bain so special um, and what makes getting to go to this amazing company every day so much more enjoyable. Um, and I think it also really helps with learning because you get to learn from all of your friends, which makes it a lot better. That's awesome. Yeah, Bainies, uh, they, they're, they, have a, they have a certain vibe. They're super fun. So I, I'm excited for you, Nicole. Thank um, you. Thank you for sharing your story, but we can't let you go yet. So we're going to ask you a couple of fun uh, personal questions. And uh, this is one that I haven't asked in a while. And I would love to know, what is your go-to Chick-fil-A order? I actually have not had Chick-fil-A that many times because I grew up in New York City. So... They like back then they didn't really have Chick-fil-A, but in Charlottesville, there are a ton of Chick-fil-A's and I would say probably the chicken, like the biscuit breakfast thing. I don't know what those are called. I think it's, yeah, chicken biscuit. Yeah, whatever that is. It's so good. It's like the mini ones and they come in like a little pack of three with like the biscuit and a little piece of chicken. It's so good. (laughs) That's amazing. So you're you're a breakfast uh, Chick-fil-A-er. Yeah, I think so. I'm a big fan of their breakfast. It's good stuff. Amazing. All right, yeah, on your resume, you say that you enjoy cooking. So what's a, what's a, a favorite dish you've been enjoying lately? I love to cook and bake. When I'm home, my dad is like the chef at home, so I don't cook as much. Um, but I think when I'm at school and like if I have friends over, I really like to make this like spicy penne a la vodka and definitely more fun when it's homemade mm-hmm. pasta because it always impresses people when it's homemade pasta but it's really an easy dish to make and like most of the ingredients you probably would have in your pantry um and everyone always loves it okay well uh, i'm coming coming over, over for dinner one of these nights i'm looking forward to it <laughs> all right last question uh i know you did some traveling this summer what's your what's a favorite memory or kind of highlight from from the summer um yeah i was really lucky to get to travel around a little bit i think one of my favorite memories is one of the days that we had in mykonos we went to this like beautiful kind of isolated beach um that like you can't really get there besides car like there's no public transportation um and they only have one tavern there for lunch so you have to wait there for like however long the wait is um but it was so fun to get to spend the day there with my friends like just hanging out um, and it was like very mellow compared to the rest of like what you would think of typical Mykonos vibes. So it was really, that was a really fun day and one of my favorite memories. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. That's epic. All right. Well, thank you for, for answering all of my questions today. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Um, best of luck at, at Bain. Uh, and uh, this has been Nicole uh, Riem. Thank you for joining the podcast. Thank you so much for having me.